Hello, welcome to the AIA Las Vegas Women in Architecture August presentation. The Women in Architecture Committee was established to recognize and raise awareness of gender equality in the profession and to engage members through education and social programs. The chair of the committee is Dieta Ewing, and we welcome all of you to join us and work with us here in Las Vegas. Our program this evening is very important to everyone who creates. Raise your IPIQ, or what every owner, builder, architect should know about the creation, protection, and use of intellectual property. You will note that you have an opportunity to ask questions uh, to be answered at the end of the session, or when those questions are presented. There is also a chat button that you may use to leave comments and so forth. And if we don't get to all of your questions during this session, Kim will get back to you uh, with the answers later. And now I am so honored to introduce Kim Cooper, attorney with Greenberg Traurig Law Firm. Kim advises creators, nonprofits, and companies across a broad spectrum of industries in all facets of intellectual property law, including copyright. She educates her clients on effective strategies for acquiring, maintaining, and enforcing their domestic and international intellectual property assets. She employs best practices to protect client assets and minimize disputes and she represents clients when those disputes cannot be avoided. Her clients include e-commerce, entertainment and construction companies, as well as manufacturers, restaurateurs, and of course, architects. Welcome, Kim, and thank you for being here to share this important information with us. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody today. So what we're going to talk about, obviously, is intellectual property. There are a handful of, there we go. Uh, intellectual property is made up of a handful of different areas of law. So today we're going to go through and cover copyright, trademark, patent, and trade secret. You'll see from the diagram that some of these areas overlap, where others are discrete and separate. Uh, Kim, you're not sharing the screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why it kicked me off. Okay. There we go. Here, let me go back. There we go. Are we good? We're good. Awesome. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, right, we're going to cover copyright, trademark, patent, and trade secret. And the diagram that you now see will uh, show you that some of these areas overlap where others do not. So we're going to start with copyright. This is going to be the bulk of the presentation as this uh, copyright uh, contains most of the uh, intellectual property assets that you'll come across uh, within the um, within the building and uh, resident and uh, uh, real estate development industry. Okay. So what exactly is copyright? And um, where do you see it? What is it? What is it not? So copyright is actually uh, a right that is enumerated in the Constitution. So uh, it is expressly provided. It's something that uh, states can't do away with, uh, nor can the federal government, because it is baked into our actual Constitution. Uh, copyright protects original works of authorship that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So. You basically have to create something that's your own and it needs to be fixed. That just means that it needs to be finished. It does not protect okay, ideas and facts, works that are in the public domain, uh, procedures, systems, names, titles, phrases, you can read the rest. Um, we'll talk, we'll circle back and talk a little bit about public domain and what that means. And we'll also discuss uh, scenes of fair and sweat of the brow because a lot of what architects do may fall under either of those two um, exceptions. And then copyright, how long does it last? It lasts a really, really long time. So uh, if you are the author of the work, it's going to, your copyright, your right in that work is going to last for your life plus 70 years. 
if that work was created by uh, your employer, so let's say you were hired uh, to be an architect for an architectural firm, then the firm owns the work, the fir firm is the author, and so then you uh, look at a term of 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation, whichever one is first. And then there are also works for hire, anonymous and pseudonymous works. When, uh, before the most recent Copyright Act was enacted, you had to provide notice of your copyright, of your rights and your copyright, uh, in order for you to continue to maintain protection. That's been done away with. However, uh, if you provide notice, then that helps the public know that you're claiming your copyrights in the work and that it's not in the public domain. Because as we'll discuss, the public domain is very confusing to people. So it's suggested that any time that you create a work, that you uh, put a copyright notice on it. So for example, it's going to be the circle C symbol, the year uh, of publication, yeah, if it was published, and then whoever is claiming rights. So if it's uh, an architectural firm, it'll be the firm. If it's an individual, it'll be that individual's name. Uh, registration, no longer required. It's not required uh, in order to get copyright protection. However, if you want to be able to enforce your copyright, you need to have it registered. What that means is you have to file an application with the Copyright Office. Uh, applications are um, between 45 and 65 dollars. Uh, currently, uh, depending on circumstances, uh, the, the price may, may change 45 to 65. Um, and you'll need to have that um, registration in hand before you uh, are able to file a lawsuit. Okay, so what exactly is covered? Okay, the Copyright Act enumerates the specific areas or types of works. You can read those. What does that really mean? It pretty much means anything that you have created that's original, right? And that's not what we talked about before, facts and ideas and titles. So it covers software, advertisements, newsletters, right? business plans, um, architectural plans, <laughs> three-dimensional renderings, three-dimensional sculptural art, right? So you can also take a photograph uh, of uh, a building that you've, uh, you've designed and then had a, maybe a, a three-dimensional model created of it. Those are all things that can be copyrighted. I want you to take note that that also includes uh, carpet and fabric patterns because this will come into play if you are specking FF&Es and you'll wanna be aware that there may be copyright protections in, um, in those elements. All right, uh, what is an architectural work? As you saw, that's a specifically enumerated. It was um, added to the Copyright Act expressly. And so an architectural work is covered and it is considered the design of a building as embodied in any tangible medium of expression, including the building itself, the architectural plans or the drawings. The work includes uh, the overall form as well as the arrangement and composition of the spaces and elements in the design, but it does not include individual standard features. So remember when I mentioned the scenes affair, this is kind of where that exception falls. So copyright will not, will protect your, your plans, but it won't protect those individual standard features. Okay, so what would they be? Well, for example, uh, if there is a recognized style that uses specific architectural elements, such as right, your neoclassical style, Tudor, Craftsman, those are considered scenes of fair or standard, and so they are accepted. You can't protect those. Uh, any design elements that are attributed to building codes, topography, pre-existing structures on the, on the construction site, and anything that is uh, out of necessity for engineering purposes, that's also not protected under copyright. And then standard placement of functional elements, uh, how you have to route flow of traffic and methods of construction, those are also are not protected. So after all the unprotected elements are removed, right? what is left is what is protectable to you with your copyright. So most architectural plans are considered thin and they're afforded limited amount of protection. Doesn't mean that they're not protected, but because there is so much functionality that goes into an architectural plan that you'll find that 
when you kind of peel back all those unprotected elements that sometimes it's very it's maybe fairly small a number of elements that are protected however they are protected and if they're unique or um, something that is very pleasing that other people might want to replicate you want to make sure that you have those plans copyrighted so that you can protect uh, those that design that you've created a good example is the win the win has a number of copyright applications and um, or I should say registrations, and they've been very successful at enforcing them. So it is not impossible uh, to protect your work. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, but what is not copyright? What doesn't fall within the realm of copyright? Okay, uh, as strange as this may seem, uh, there were uh, works that uh, don't have human authorship. So there was a very famous case, and you may have come across it in the, in the news, of a monkey that took a photographer's camera and snapped a selfie. And there was debate over does the, who owns it? Who's the author? Who created it? Was the monkey the copyright holder or was it the photographer? And basically the court said neither because a uh, monkey, the, the Copyright Act makes clear that it has to be, uh, it has to be, um, human or in, in 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 the law we have a legal fiction that that corporations are persons um, but they can't be animals <laughs> so monkeys out so uh <laughs> it works with uh, non-human authorship do not get copyright protection works that are not fixed so uh, we are recording this uh, presentation so if we weren't recording it, it wouldn't be fixed. I would be giving it live, you would be viewing it, and I would have no copyright protection in this presentation. But because we are making a recording, there's, an, uh, there's a copyright in this presentation, in the recording of it, uh, because it is being fixed. Okay. Works that have fallen into the public domain, again, we'll talk about what that means. Uh, right now, any works that were created um, up and up and through 1924 are in the public domain and then works that have been dedicated to the public okay one way to do that is through uh, as you'll see um, there's a, a license and uh, the creative commons has a licensing scheme and people can dedicate their work and sometimes you'll see this um, you'll see this designation on the work itself and it's expressly gives up copyright and it allows anybody to use it for any any reason. Okay. So if you have a copyright, what do you own? What is it? Exactly. So we think of copyright as a bundle of sticks and you can kind of pull each stick out and hold it and hold those interests and you can break those sticks into itty bitty pieces. So copyright has multiple layers. Um, there are basically five specific rights, the right to reproduce, which is simply the right to make copies, the right to prepare derivatives, so new versions or ad adaptations, which may come into play uh, if you are hired to take over an existing project from another architect. You need to be mindful that that may be actually a derivative work because you're using their underlying work as your initial basis. So we can discuss a little bit more about that. Uh, to distribute, right? So to make available to the public, that's a, a third right, perform it publicly, right? And this can be through uh, radio broadcasts, transmission on television, right? There's a variety of ways public performance is, is uh, categorized and then display publicly. Who is an author and who is the owner? Okay, so there are times where the author and the owner is going to be the same, right? So the general rules of the person who creates the work is the author and the owner. However, as I mentioned previously, if you create a work as an employee and you create that work within the scope of your employment, right? So classic example is I'm an architect. I've been hired at the firm to, right, uh, create drawings, build buildings, right, all those fun things, then the work that I produce will qualify for copyright protection, right? We've discussed what those elements are. 
but who owns it, I might be the author because I initially did it, but because I did it as an employee, then the company, the firm becomes the author and the owner. So it's one tricky place, uh, something to be aware of. Uh, if a person, the, another, another way that uh, an author and owner may not be the same, uh, if the person who creates the work uh, created it via commission, right? It's a, a special order. They have to, if that's the case, so if you do any work, spec work on the side, then you're creating, you're creating a separate work and you're creating it, you're the author, but if you have agreed in writing to do it, then the person who contracted with you may be the author and the owner. And the reason I say may be is because it has to fall into one of these categories that's listed on the very bottom, right? So in order for that to, to happen, the, uh, the work has to be a contribution to a collective work, part of a motion picture, a translation, supplementary work, a compilation, test, so on. There's just nine. So if what you're doing doesn't fall under, under that category, then it can't be a work for hire uh, under the Copyright Act. Okay? Instead, what happens is you need to have a writing and there has to be an assignment. Okay? So architectural works are not listed in the nine categories as works for hire. So Again, right, unless the architect is an employee of the owner or the builder, the default is that the architect or the firm, right, because if you're an employee of the firm, the firm is going to be the, own, the author and the owner, uh, but the architect owns the copyrights and the drawings, plans, and buildings. So if I'm, if I'm a uh, resident, uh, let's say I'm, uh, I'm the owner and I right, have a uh, real estate development and I hire the architect, so unless the contract states the who is going to be the owner of the copyright, the default is going to be that the architect or the architectural firm is going to be the copyright owner. So contract law can shift who owns the underlying works. So you want to be very mindful of that. Okay, so as you can see, contract language then becomes critically important to this relationship. So for example, an architect may seek to uh, to make the transfer of the copyright ownership or a continued exclusive license uh, contingent upon a full and final payment, right? Because if in the contract, as the architect, you automatically uh, grant the, um, the owner builder the copyright, then if they fail to pay, you, you have a straight breach of contract, right? If you, if you, if you hold back that transfer of the copyright, the ownership of the copyright until final payment, then you have the additional leverage of a potential copyright infringement claim. So it's it's a just it's a strategic matter of how you want to kind of um, I don't want to say stack the deck, but give yourself some additional additional leverage. Conversely, if you are the owner builder, right, you may very well want to seek an immediate. Uh, uh, assignment upon execution of the of the underlying contract so that way there is uh, no risk that the, if there's a disagreement that the architect can run to court excuse me and try and file an injunction or otherwise try and hold up the project based on the architect's underlying continued right in that copyright all right so here are some examples uh, of what are work made for hire. So uh, a uh, company employs uh, a software programmer and the programmer works for the company and the programmer creates the software for the company as part of the programmer's job and the company owns the copyright. Here, the second example is copyright hires a software programmer for a one-time gig creating an app. The programmer works from home using her own computer, on her own time, on her own schedule, and paid a fixed fee. This is often considered an independent uh, contractor agreement. The company probably does not own the underlying copyright, and so that will have to be decided through uh, contract and with a, an assignment written within the body of the agreement. Okay. Sometimes it's hard to know in advance 
which one it'll be. Okay. So this is why you see contractual language that says something like, right, if, uh, this is a work made for hire, but if it's not, then the copyright owner assigns its rights. So play it safe and assume you don't own the copyright. If you want to be the owner, let's assume that you're not and make sure that the contract uh, actually addresses those issues. Okay, where then does copyright pop up? Well, in more places than you may think. So if you take a picture, uh, take a, a look at the picture and um, think about where all the potential copyrights may be in this. You might be surprised. So Mattel owns the copyright in Barbie. The cake baker owns the copyright in the actual cake design. And then there was the photographer, the person who snapped the pit, right? And that photographer owns the copyright in the photograph. So copyright can be very multi-layered with lots of parties owning a discrete element. What you might think of as one whole thing may actually be multiple, multiple copyrights. Okay, so here we're gonna talk about copyright myths. We're gonna talk about the public domain. Please, these are myths. These are not true, and we'll I'll talk a little bit more about them uh, in further detail. Okay, here's a big one. If an image is on the internet, it is in the public domain. Remember, we talked about works. Works that are in the public domain do not have copyright protection, right? So being in the public domain means they're free for anybody to use. But again, just because someone puts something on the internet does not mean that it has lost its copyright protection and that's in the public domain. This is important, right? Because we've got, especially now with social media, we have people kind of clicking and posting and they're right, click and copy and post. And um, a lot of things are kind of free flowing back and forth when you may not actually own the underlying copyright of the thing that you're um, kind of uh, forwarding or using, unfortunately. Uh, if I buy if I buy a work of art, this could be anything, right? If I buy a, um, uh, an oil painting, if I buy the, um, well, no, we don't have albums. I'm really dating myself. Um, <laughs> if I if I if I buy the the download, if I download an album. Um, I own I own the work, right? But you don't. You own you own the thing, the physical thing that embodies the copyright, but you don't own the copyright. Remember, we talked about copyright are all those five rights. So you can't make, let's say you buy um, an oil painting and you and you love it and you think it would uh, really sell well. Like you, there are lots of, you've had friends who've said, oh, I wish I could have a copy. And you're like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a pic and I'm gonna make a poster. Well, you can't do that because you don't have the right to make a copy and distribute it, right? because you don't own the underlying copyright in the image, right, in the painting, you just own the physical painting, okay? Uh, if there's no copyright notice on the work, I don't need permission to, to use it. Well, as we talked about, you don't have to have notice. This is why notice is good, because it lets people know that you're claiming your, right, your copyrights in that work. But if there's not a notice, do not assume that you can use the work. That work still may be covered uh, by copyright. Uh, if I don't profit from the use, right? I'm not infringing, right? I haven't done anything wrong. If I'm not making money off of it, it's okay. Not the case. Uh, Copyright Act, um, there's nothing in it that says if you aren't making a profit or if you are a nonprofit entity and you've taken somebody's copyright and used it without permission, that somehow that gets you off the hook. It doesn't. Uh, this is a big one in the art community. If I alter an image by magical X percent, I don't need permission to use the work. And that is just simply not the case. There is no magical number at which you can uh, change a work for it to no longer uh, be infringing, right? Um, so be very mindful of that. Uh, that comes around and bites people in the butt uh, often. Uh, and then if I only use a part of the work, I don't need permission. So that's not accurate either. There's, um, there's a very famous case that talks about um, uh, the heart of a work. So often the courts will look to see, uh, yeah, you may have used a small portion and you may, right, of that work, but that maybe that portion was the heart of the work. 
it really it goes to uh, what makes that unique um, valuable or why the public wants to see it or buy it or what have you. Um, and so uh, a lot of this kind of got um, hashed out in uh, in the music industry with sampling. <laughs> uh, prior to that, it was the the, the seminal case is about um, uh, use of a uh, someone's uh, parts of an, uh, a biography, and uh, nobody wanted to buy the book after the news article came out that talked about what was so very sought after this information. So be very mindful. Okay, so using stuff from the internet. Okay, please don't. <laughs> Just don't. There's obviously it, it's it's a myth, but the people believe it. They they don't understand uh, exactly how copyright functions. So this is just an example of um, someone's response uh, to someone claiming copyright uh, that this is copyright infringement, and the person said, "No, if you post their if they post their art online, it's free for us to use." Uh, not the case. And stuff from the internet. Okay, material on the internet is not automatically in the public domain, including photographs. There's been a recent. Onslaught of celebrities being sued for posting pictures of themselves on social media, right? So, right, you'd think it's a picture of me. But what did we talk about before with Barbie, right? The person who snapped the pic is the person who owns the copyright. So, right, the celebrity is like, hey, this is me, and they they forward it on, and then they get tagged with a copyright infringement suit because they don't own the copyright in the photo that they're that they're posting or reposting in those cases. Um, and this applies not just to individuals, but to companies. So for example, uh, there's a fashion brand that posted a picture of Cardi B in the, the brand's floral jacket. Now, right, as soon as they posted it, they were promptly sued by the photographer, the person who actually owned the picture. And there you go, so <laughs> picture of the floral jacket. Uh, I can, you know, you can see why. They would want to use it as uh, wonderful marketing, but um, they don't own the photograph, so uh, bad choice. Okay, yes, I'm on track. <laughs> okay, now we're moving on to trademarks. Uh, trademarks, we are all actually very, very familiar with them. There's not a lot of misconception over trademarks, I think because we see them in our daily lives and we understand what they mean. Uh, trademark, however, can be, um, uh, trademarks are, are a word, a, a phrase, a symbol, it can actually be even a color or a sound that consumers identify um, as coming from a specific source, right? Uh, trademarks are usually associated with goods and, and products. Service marks are for services, but you'll hear trademark used consistently for goods or services and sometimes just the shortened mark. Okay. so. What are what are trademarks? Okay, as we talked about, they're words, right? So Old Spice, Google, just some examples. I'm sure ones that you're very familiar with. Slogans. A slogan can be trademark. So we talked about copyright, right? Copyright doesn't cover words and titles or slogans. So how do you protect those via trademark? Okay, so here's a couple of of slogans that you may be familiar with. Uh, uh, yeah, well, no, not your father's Oldsmobile is a little is a little old, and so is the nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, aching, stubby head fever, so you can rest. Medicine slogan too. Oh, I'm dating myself again. And then uh, trademark also covers designs or what we often will call logos. So you can see these designs, and uh, and you know immediately which company, what source these goods or services are coming from. Uh, you'll also notice. Right, that these are uh, potentially creative works, right? They're, they're original works that are fixed. So here's where there's a potential overlap. If you have a logo that you have created or that you use for your uh, company or for your, your personal, for yourself, for your own services, that logo may rise to the level of uh, copyrightability so that you can file a copyright application for it. And at the same time, file a trademark application. And so you get a double layer of protection. This helps with enforcement. So there's uh, a handful of um, 
there's a hand, there's a couple of different ways that you can uh, take down infringing works. One of them is by claiming copyright uh, in that work, and another way is by claiming trademark infringement. As I mentioned, trademarks also cover sounds and colors. So I think we're all pretty familiar with the lion's roar or the chime for NBC. And then um, Tiffany has a trademark and it's blue, robin egg blue color as well. All right, what else? Designs, non-functional designs are also considered a trademark. So here we have the shape of the Coca-Cola bottle, the red sole, um, of Louis Vuitton, and then the uh, shape of the Hershey's kiss. Okay. All right, now that you know what a trademark is, what are they good for? Okay. So trademarks, well, they symbolize the goodwill of a business, and they're uh, valuable to you because you can oft often use trademarks as an asset Lenders will see them and you can use them to collateralize or secure a loan. Uh, also, you can uh, trademarks if you um, have a business that you would like to franchise. So you, the cornerstone of franchising is uh, trademarks. So you'll need to, you want a, a strong trademark so that you can um, monetize, monetize that through franchising. Uh, also, you'll find that um, if you would like to sell at some point, you would like to sell your business. If you have registrations for your copyrights for all of your intellectual property assets, but your trademarks as well, that those then are added to the valuation of your the of your company. Uh, if you own a trademark, then you have the right to exclude others. Just like copyright, you own the right, and you can prevent others from uh, encroaching, right? So you can exclude others from using, in this case with trademarks, um, any other mark that might be confusingly similar. Uh, also, if you happen to offer uh, goods through Amazon, then uh, you can take advantage of Amazon's brand registry, and this allows you to register your trademark with Amazon and exclude others from being able to use that trademark on their Amazon storefronts. So especially now amongst uh, the pandemic and uh, we're all buying online. So if you are a seller and you have your own brand of goods, this is um, extraordinarily important for you because that allows you to control the universe of what um, online consumers see and have access to. And then the other benefit of having uh, a, a trademark registration is that um, if someone has if someone comes along and what we call um, is a cyber squatter, picks a domain name that is uh, either uses your actual trademark or something similar there, you don't have to go into federal court and do a full litigation. There's an abbreviated procedure um, under the Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy. Anytime that you, you sign up to, to get a, um, a, a URL, a domain name, you agree to this policy. And so it's more of an administrative procedure and it's far less costly than uh, full litigation. So it's an alternative means for you to take that um, infringing uh, a domain name, to you know, take that from the infringer and uh, give it to you without having to file a lawsuit in federal court. Uh, unlike copyright, even though copyright lasts for a very long time, it does expire. Trademarks will never expire as long as you continue to use them. So if if you're if you build a company and um, you continue to offer goods or services right using that name that brand name of the company you will continue to have trademark rights as long as you continue to use it. Uh, you will need to if you have a federal registration you'll need to renew so there is uh, some administration administrative requirements uh, if you have a federal registration. However, you don't have to register your um, your trademark with uh, the United States Patent and Trademark Office. However, just as um, uh, copyright right registration gives you benefits uh, with copyright, you can sue in court. Uh, registering your trademark with um, the USPTO 
uh, provides you confers certain benefits as well. Okay, and here we are. <laughs> so, uh, a great one. Uh, one of the benefits is constructive notice of your claim of ownership. So, uh, if you've taken, uh, spent a lot of time and money and energy building your brand, right, your uh, company name, the name of right, the uh, or your goods and services, you want to be able to uh, to protect that. And one of them is uh, constructive notice. Okay, what does that mean? So there's a couple of things. Constructive notice puts everybody on notice that this is yours. So even if they truly didn't know, it's a legal fiction, what we call legal fiction. It says, look, this sits on the principal register at the USPTO. Anybody, it's all public record, has um, access to it. And so if a second uh, secondary user comes along and they, they pluck that your name and they start using your name, there is um, already, you can say, no, I had it, I had it and you were on notice. Um, that provides you with an opportunity to um, uh, uh, assert a claim of willfulness, which increases your uh, ability to get larger damages. The other benefit is that once you uh, file, then the USPTO does a handful of work for you, <laughs> which is lovely. So um, when you file, What's going to happen is you're going to file your application and uh, the, an, an examining attorney at the USPTO is going to look at their records and see if there is any existing trademarks that may be confusingly similar to yours. If there isn't, then it gets to move forward and you get a registration. Once you have that registration, you have that lovely benefit as well so that now you sit on the registry and if a third party comes in and files a trademark application for a mark that's confusingly similar, then the examining attorney is going to look at all the records and they may and they're going to hit on yours and they're going to refuse that later filed application. So they're doing some of that work for you to protect your the rights of uh, the rights that you have in your in your trademark, which is really remarkable when you consider that a trademark application, an actual filing fee is like $275 uh, right now. Um, and if you are able to secure registration, the USPTO will continue to, to look and may block uh, future applications by third parties and not allow them to register. You don't have to pay any more money. That's, that's part of what they do. Uh, so aside from the, um, the continued administrative fees, right, the renewal and so on, um, that's it. You're good. Um, the other, as I mentioned, um, with regard to Amazon brand registry, if you have federal registration, then there's a legal presumption that you're the owner. And that's uh, why with Amazon and their brand registry, if you have a federal registration, you submit it and then they block all other users. Again, a wonderful benefit that you, you know, shelled out a filing fee of 275. It's phenomenal. <laughs> And then, as I mentioned um, earlier as well, that you can um, copyright and trademark. There are mechanisms that allow you to um, get infringing content removed. Those are usually through takedown policies that are um, posted on a variety of different um, social media and ISP websites. So if you have a federal registration in your trademark or a federal registration for your copyright, you can submit those. Uh, online, let's say through whether it's Facebook or uh, Instagram or um, Amazon and um, show that you own it and they will take it down. So again, wonderful benefit for a very small amount of capital investment. Uh, then the other benefit with federal registration is that if you are offering services or goods in foreign countries, you can use the you can use your existing U.S. registration as the basis for those foreign registrations, and then uh, a huge benefit for anybody who creates makes products, especially makes products um, uh, that are made overseas, and people may copy overseas and try and import. What you can do is, if you have a trademark registration, you can uh, register it with the U.S. Customs Office. Again. Uh, I'm trying to remember the last time I checked, the fee was like $190 and it lasts five to 10 years. Don't quote me, I can't quite remember. Uh, but again, nominal fee. And then the customs 
right? U.S. Customs, when shipments come in to the U.S., right, they come in through a port and a customs agent will look. And if you filed your, your trademark registration, it'll be checked against the goods that are coming in. And if there's something that they think may be infringing, right, uh, um, and basically counterfeit, they'll pull it and they'll contact you. So again, the, the, the capital investment is very, very small in with when you look at the value of what you get, right? You, you have the might of the, of the US government doing a lot of work for you. All right, so here's a biggie, right? Trademark clearance, please don't get sued. Okay, so um, if, you, if you are looking to uh, adopt a mark, there's a couple things you wanna consider, okay? Not all trademarks are created equal. There's um, kind of a sliding scale. So you have words that are not protectable at all, and then you have words that are highly, highly protectable. And the, so the closer, the closer you can get down to the, the end where you're looking at arbitrary or coined, the better, right? So that makes them, um, you wanna go for the most distinctive mark that you can think of that would identify your goods or services, right? So what is completely not protectable as a trademark? Things that are generic. So I list zipper and cellophane. And I list them there specifically to let you know that zipper and cellophane were once trademarks. They didn't protect them. And so people started using the word zipper to describe a zipper, what we now consider a zipper. And the same thing with cellophane. So what was once actually coined, right, totally made up, is now considered generic. So that's just a warning that if you do have a, a, a trademark, that you need to be mindful that you don't allow, that you yourself and you don't allow others to use it as a noun for the thing um, that you are offering. Then the, uh, the next is descriptive. So in this case, right, American Airlines to describe an airline in America. So if it's descriptive, you generally do not get any protection. American Airlines has protection because they have acquired what's called secondary meaning. They've used it for so long and exclusively that the um, trademark law allows them some form of protection. I generally suggest not choosing a mark that is descriptive because it is very, very challenging uh, to protect it until you get to the point of secondary meaning. And you may never reach the point of secondary meaning. You will find marketing folks love descriptive words um, if you do hire a marketing firm to help you, uh, please, um, you know, let them know at the gate that you you don't want to choose anything that's descriptive. Please have them, right, kind of brainstorm and at a minimum try and find uh, some ideas, some marks that are potentially suggestive, obviously fanciful and um, made up is the best. Uh, but those are the ones that are most expensive to market, right, because the consumers don't know what you are offering. So uh, you have to spend a lot more marketing dollars uh, to educate the consuming public. Again, this is suggestive Burger King, right? YouTube, and then arbitrary uh, Apple and Amazon, right? Apple is a thing, it exists, but consumers don't think of Apple as being associated and, and Apple being associated with computers. We all know what the Amazon is, uh, but we don't associate the Amazon with an online e-retailer or a, a bookseller at the time when they started. Um, so again, when you're thinking about branding, try and lean towards the um, more coined and fanciful side. All right, here. So you've got an idea of a couple of trademarks that you're thinking about, or you have one that you really, really love. Uh, you need to clear your mark. This is the whole don't get sued. <laughs> So you want to make sure that you can use it. That means somebody else isn't already using it for um, the goods or services that you want to use it for. Okay, so uh, you don't want to spend a ton of money out the gate to brand your company or your services uh, only to later receive a cease, a cease and desist. I unfortunately have a handful of clients or client, people that come to me that become clients because they've received a cease and desist. And they're like, I don't understand what this is. Why did I get this? 
And um, I had one client that I was just, it was heartbreaking. She um, was changing. She wanted to um, change careers and um, she loved, uh, she wanted to take her passion for coffee and, um, you know, um, wanted to become a barista and open up her own coffee shop. And she didn't clear the mark that she used. She had um, opened up a shop, created signage and cups and napkins and menus and the whole nine yards only to then um, three months after opening, receiving a letter. And um, we worked hard to, to be able to provide her with um, the opportunities to transition to a new name. But unfortunately she did pick a name that already existed in the marketplace uh, for a uh, gourmet coffee um, uh, supplier. And they've been in the market for 15 years. So there was, there was no, there was no way around that. And so um, it was, it was very difficult because she had used, right. She had used um, her parts of her, her um, retirement in order to kind of, follow her dream. So please, right, uh, at least do a minimum to clear your trade part. So again, if you, if you, if you make it up, you make it up, that's fantastic, right? You've made it up. <laughs> Most likely nobody has it. Okay. Um, uh, the other is we talked about, don't pick something that's descriptive. That's not going to help you. You can't protect it. You can't stop others from using it. You can't stop others from using coffee for coffee shops or, you know, coffee beans. Um, Trademark rights begin with use, so you want to make sure that nobody else is using your the mark that you're thinking about, um, so that you don't again waste your your money. Uh, you can do a couple of things on your own. You don't have to hire an attorney for this. Okay, you can do a, right do a general online search. Google it. Okay, so I just use Google, which is a mark for right online searching platform, as a verb. So uh, Google works very hard, by the way, um, to make sure it doesn't fall into that generic category. Uh, they spend a lot of ad dollars to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so, yeah, so do an online search. Google the name that you're considering. Uh, search social media and, and other e-commerce sites if you're going to be offering products. But social media is great, right? Sometimes people don't have companies or startups don't even have a website. They just use a, they use a Facebook page. Uh, and then you can also search the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office website. It, it, the, the, the database is open to the public and it is very easy to search and there are video tutorials. So you can spend you know, an hour or so on it with a tutorial and then do it yourself. So at a minimum, kind of do those things to make sure that the, something, a trademark that you're considering isn't already existing in the marketplace for the for the same services or goods that you're going to offer. All right, so when you see those symbols next to a trademark, what does that mean? Okay. So when you see the circle R, that means that there's a federal registration and there's a claim to nationwide rights. Okay. So you can only use the circle R if your trademark is registered, right? Registered with the USPTO. If you see a TM or an SM, that means that the the trademark owner is claiming common law copyrights. Remember I said trademark rights start with use and you don't have to have a federal registration. Okay. So if you um, find it, uh, you know, you, you land on a trademark that you like and you've done a clearance and there's nobody else that you could, that you've been able to see that uses it, um, preferably you made it up and, uh, but you don't want to spend the money to get it registered. You don't have to, you can still get, put people on notice by putting, if you're, Putting, if you're um, using the mark with goods, putting a TM on the label. So you'll have your mark and then in the upper right hand corner, you're going to write a little TM and that's going to put everybody on notice that you're offering, that, that you're claiming uh, common law trademark rights in that, in that name. Similar services, advertisements, flyers, your website, you can use SM. All right, we're on to patents. Ooh, I am chugging along. Okay. <laughs> We just might have time. Um, all right. There are lots of questions. Okay. So patents, uh, as we talked about, right? Uh, patents uh, falls under the larger umbrella of intellectual property. And patents protect uh, ideas that are novel, non-obvious, and useful. Okay? There's 
two different types, two different types of patents, a uh, utility patent and a design patent. There's also a plant patent, but we're not going to discuss that. Um, so this is this is a utility patent. You think of inventions, right? This is what most people think of when they think of a patent. So building a better mousetrap. Here's an actual patent for a mousetrap. <laughs> this person built a better mousetrap and they were able to get a patent on it. So when you think of patents, you can think of formularies for chemical products, um, you know, beauty aids, pharmaceuticals. They would also include, right, uh, formularies you know, right, with regard to, let's say, that um, you're on the builder side and you've come up with your own formulation, let's say, for an adhesive or something specific to maybe the geographic area where you um, do most of your work, something that um, you haven't been able to find a broader national solution to, right, from a, an existing manufacturer, so you've created your own. Well, depending on that formulation, you may actually have something that's patentable in that formula. The other thing that falls, well, other things that will fall under a utility patent are going to be uh, business methods, manufacturing processes, software, right? So what you're looking at is basically something novel, meaning new, uh, non-obvious, which means um, somebody who's skilled in the art, somebody who is within your industry, right? Something that they wouldn't necessarily go, well, of course, we all do that, okay? And then useful, right? So it needs to have some sort of useful usefulness. It has to function in some way, okay? Something to keep in mind, uh, if you are um, considering a patent or you have invented something, um, in the United States, you've got one year. So from the, from the time that you've made it um, pub public. So whether you've, um, whether that whether you've officially published it, let's say you went to a conference and you you did a presentation on it, right, that's a publication, um, or you've posted on your website. You're, it's a great marketing tool, and so your marketing department's like, yeah, let's let's promote this. Well, as soon as you've put it on your website, you've disclosed it, and the one year clock starts to tick. So if you are interested in obtaining a patent, patents provide you with exclusive use, right? It's just like trademark and copyright you're going to have 100% control over that, that invention. It's gonna to belong to you exclusively and you get to dole out use, whatever, however, however, whatever kind of uses you want to be able to uh, give to third parties or not, right? You may create a patent specifically to exclude your competitors in the marketplace from being able to use this, right? So that can be an important tool as well. Um, and then the term of a patent is 20 years. So it's uh, 20 years from the date of filing. It usually takes two to three years. So you have an effective patent uh, for 17. Now you can enforce your patent even when it's still going through the um, application process. And uh, what happens is if, if anybody infringes on your patent during that time, this kind of lack of time before you get a registration, um, uh, they're still liable. So because the process takes a while, um, the, you can still recover, um, uh, you can still sue for infringement and recover damages for any infringement that happened prior to your registration, as long as it happened after your filing date. All right, design patents. So why do I bring up design patents? Uh, I'm bringing up design patents because, again, we talked about how often uh, architectural firms will uh, spec FFNEs. And depending on the client and the size of the project, uh, project it may be, if you're doing a large uh, hotel, casino, uh, you may need a lot of one type of item, right? One type of sconce, one type of chair. And so internally, you may have um, people who spec those things. And then the client maybe comes to you and says, oh yeah, I really like that. I like that one. And then when you go to source it, you contact or your buyer contacts a manufacturer and the manufacturer copies what you say you want and makes it. Well, if that, if, if that um, piece that you spec and now you're purchasing um, either uh, is copied based on something that's copyrighted or it is copied from something that has a design patent, you 
and the owner can be um, sued for copyright infringement. So I'll, even though the manufacturer, right, the manufacturer made it for you and the manufacturer made a copy and gave it to you, right, you're going to be on the hook. So be very mindful if you're going to spec FF and E's that you, there's a couple things you can do, right? You can ensure that you are buying them from, from the manufacturer. In Nevada, especially, there's a, there's a statute that basically says if I'm a seller, then um, there's, an, there's an, uh, an implied, um, basically an implied warranty that says I'm selling you something I have the right to sell you. Okay, so you're protected under that layer. Um, uh, but if you, uh, so you can buy them directly from the manufacturer. If, however, the owner, the builder, um, or the buyer is is um, adamant that they they can get it cheaper someplace else, then what you want to do is you want to push that liability off onto them, and that can only be done contractually. So something to consider if you are specking FF and E's to make sure that there aren't any underlying um, either copyrights or design patents at issue in what you're specking. So um, I've given you some examples. Um, uh, th so if you have a design patent, right, um, same, you still have one year, you're, you have one year to from publication to file your application. Design patents only last for 14, not 20. Um, but a product that, that has a design patent may also be protected uh, with a utility patent. So if you find a design patent and you're concerned, you can look to see if there's also an existing utility patent. And I mentioned that because uh, patents last for 20 years for utility patents. So there's a six year window where you still may have some existing um, exposure. Uh, here are some additional design patents, things that people don't think about. Um, so the, the, the sofas, um, if you can think of um, leather sofas that have those uh, buttons, you, you, they're very popular right now. There is an existing design patent out there. So um, be mindful that whomever you're getting that from, right, uh, either you're buying it directly from the manufacturer so that you have protection or in your contract, you're pushing that liability off, off on them. Okay, so patents, again, similar to copyright and trademark, why are they, right, why do you care? Well, you don't want to get sued for infringement but patents also are valuable, right? So they are considered an asset similar to um, trademarks and copyrights, right? The rights can be licensed or assigned, so you can monetize that through licensing agreements. Um, you can sell them uh, and you can use them to obtain financing. You can, they are enforceable against infringers, right? And also you can strategically acquire them. So if you know someone's um, in the process of um, either inventing something that would be beneficial to your competitors or um, they have filed an application, right? You can acquire it to either keep it from the marketplace, right? So keep it away from your competitors or be the exclusive owner of it and make your competitors uh, license the rights if they want to use it. All right, trade secrets. All right, home stretch. I think we're gonna have some time for, for questions. Uh, all right, so, um, if you'll notice, the copyright and trademark and patents, right, they all are, you have to, you file, you file uh, applications with the federal government to get registrations. And so, therefore, they're, they're public, right? Everybody knows about them. Trade secrets, right, their value comes from being kept a secret. So, there's no overlap there. In this case, if anything gets leaked out, right, if it's if it's made public, if you make a trade secret public, then it's no longer a trade secret. So with regard to patents and trade secrets, <laughs> um, uh, you'll need to make a choice. So again, let's say that you have created, um, right, uh, you're building here in, in, or you're building in the Southwest, in the desert, and you've created some sort of adhesive. Oh, sorry, hold on real quick. Okay, 
Um, we're just trying to make sure we have time for questions. Um, and you've created an, an, an adhesive. You have a, you've got a couple of ways to go, right? You can choose to get a patent, and knowing then that you would have um, a 20-year term of exclusive rights, and after that, anybody could use it. Uh, or you could keep it as a trade secret and limit who has access to it, um, keep it confidential and secure, and then you are able to continue to benefit from it, right? Benefit from its use by you and not your competitors uh, in the marketplace for as long as you can maintain it as a secret. So what what is considered a trade secret? Uh, it's basically anything that derives independent economic value from not being generally known, right? And something that can't be readily ascertained. And you make reasonable efforts to keep it secret. I will. What does that really mean? Okay, so it's it's a valuable business secret, right? That no one that you can't easily figure out, and you treat it as a valuable secret. So it's a secret that I keep secret, and it brings me economic benefit to the exclusion of anybody, of anybody else because they don't know it. Okay, what can be a trade secret? All sorts of interesting things can be a trade secret. Again, as long as it derives economic value, right? It gives you economic value. So think about, right, your uh, customer contact info, biographical information, your their purchase history, uh, inventories, right, or um, suppliers, right? So if you have a product or, a con or control, um, system that you use and it's exceptionally efficient, that may be something that you can patent and make public or you can keep it as a trade secret. Uh, formulas so uh, uh, or, or uh, recipes and processes. And then of course your sales figures, uh, incentive programs, discounts that you give to certain uh, clients for certain volume goods, that kind of thing. Okay. Examples, things that we know. So Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola keeps their recipe a trade secret. And so they have the recipe stored in a, in a bank vault and only a few people know the combination and the recipe itself. WD-40, they mix their product at three different locations so that one no, not one location has the entire formula as a whole. And then KFC, for their uh, hasty uh, coating, similar to the WD-40, they mix it in two different places. It's then combined so that, again, no one location has the full formula. So they have gone to, right, they've taken steps, measures to keep it secret. All right, so we talked. A, I talked a little bit about this previously. Right? So if the you have you have something right that has economic value and it may be something that is a subject matter that's eligible for a patent, you have to make a choice. Right. So patent protection requires disclosure in exchange for that monopoly. Right? But it's only for 20 years. Whereas a trade secret, as long as you keep it secret, you don't necessarily get a monopoly. But because it's only it's only protected because you're keeping it secret, but once it's public, anybody can use it. So that's something to consider. And then um, there's no right again. You don't have to register. There's no filing fee. There's no maintenance, ongoing maintenance, renewal fees with a trade secret. But you will spend right. You'll need to spend some um, time and money to keep it a secret. So whether that means uh, setting up a separate uh, or um, uh, walled off places within your in your within your network that only certain people have access to or physically keeping it separate uh, in order to maintain its secrecy there may be some costs there uh, if selling your product could allow for reverse engineering right be something that you can reverse engineer then a patent may be better because if if you put your product right out there and someone else can reverse engineer it, then it's not going to be a trade secret for very long. Um, and then if a lot of people need access to the information in order to make your product or provide your service, 
you're gonna have a hard time maintaining that as a trade secret because too many people know the information. Uh, and if you're going to, if you're if you're going to use both, make sure one does not destroy the other. So um, you could have um, you could have part of whatever your process is. Um, part of that may have patent protection, and you may choose to keep another element of it as a trade secret. Again, making certain that that there's no overlap, that something you're claiming to keep as a trade secret isn't part of that patent that is then made public, and vice versa. Again, uh, trade secrets can have value, just like patents. Uh, so you do have considerations uh, as far as it being uh, a valuable asset for your company, being able to leverage it with regard to financing. But it may be a bit more challenging uh, to be able to um, obtain valuation. Is something to consider. And then other country considerations. Um, Trade secret law is uh, there's a uh, federal defend trade secrets act, uh, and then each individual state has their own trade secret acts. So it's it's what we call um, it's within the it's a body of law within the United States. Not every country has it. Uh, patent patents are um, also jurisdictional, but almost uh, every country actually almost every country in the world has a patent uh, system. So uh, if you are going to either manufacture uh, in another country or you plan to export to another country, you can obtain a patent uh, in that country and protect protect your, your, your product or whatever it is that you have your patent in the countries where you're operating. Whereas a trade secret, uh, if you are going to be operating in a country that doesn't recognize trade secret law, then um, it, that uh, asset may become um, exposed. And if, again, once it becomes public, then you lose the protection. So what are reasonable efforts? What do you have to do in order to maintain your trade secret? So uh, you're looking at making sure that you mark whatever it is. So if there are documents, if there are files, if there's, um, you have a specific drive, you want to make sure that it's, it's marked as confidential or private. If you can lock it, even better, um, so that you limit who can get access to it. So if you take reasonable steps to do those kinds of things, then there is a presumption that you've maintained it as a trade secret. Uh, the, so that makes it easier for you to enforce against others. It's, a re, it's what's called a rebuttable presumption, but you get the benefit um, of the presumption that you've taken reasonable efforts and it's a trade secret, and the other side has to prove otherwise. So the burden shifts to them, which from a litigation standpoint, it just makes it more costly for the other side. It's a position you'd prefer to be in. You want to be the one that makes the other side do all the hard work. Okay, so here are some things you can do, right? You can restrict the knowledge of what, what the, the trade secret is to just a number of people, restricting physical access, again, marking any materials as confidential, uh, and then making certain that you have contracts in place. So you can, um, if you're going to be discussing, right, if you're discussing a partnership, potential relationship with a third party, you obviously want to make sure you have a non-disclosure, non-circumvention agreement in place. Your employee uh, contracts should also um, have uh, pr uh, provisions that discuss a uh, trade secret and what employees can and cannot disclose. Uh, what's not helpful is uh, if you allow your employees to have personal devices and have access, and they can access whatever they need, including your confidential information, they are then taking it around on their phone, and phones are extremely vulnerable. So um, you will, it would be advisable to have uh, uh, an, uh, a policy in place with regard to how employees use their phones and what they can, what can and cannot do, and how, what they can and cannot access. Uh, and then, and then if you again, uh, as I mentioned, right? Sometimes you're marking folks, you're very excited and think that uh, you know this new product that you're uh, that you've just invented, right, is perfect for marketing. Well, if you've chosen to keep it as a trade secret, and then your marketing folks flash it all over your your website, then you've kind of now just lost your your um, protection under a trade secret law. So be mindful of that as well. 
trade secret misappropriation. What does that mean? That means somebody stole it. Somebody took your, found out your secret, either through espionage or whatnot, or they were an employee of your company, and now you're an employee of somebody else, and you suspect that uh, they've taken trade secrets or they're using it, right? Um, so misappropriation is the, the term that's used, uh, and um, there is uh, a handful, of, there's federal law, as I mentioned, and Nevada, Nevada law, uh, you'll need to be able to, again, prove that you've taken reasonable efforts and that the disclosure was um, was made through improper improper means. Consequences. So um, if you had an employee who took trade secrets, you can obtain monetary damages. Uh, punitive damages are uh, damages on top of what your actual monetary damages are basically saying, right, to the company or the person, you know, shame, shame, shame on you, and we don't want you or anyone else to do this ever again, so we're going to add an additional layer of damages on top. Uh, attorney's fees, which a lot of people are very happy to hear because, uh, unfortunately, attorneys can be kind of expensive. <laughs> Litigation is expensive, and so having an attorney, having attorney's fees available to you if you're a prevailing party is a wonderful way of offsetting that cost. Conjunctive relief can be very, very important. So if you discover that you've got an employee who recently left and started a competing business, and you know or you suspect that they've taken uh, your trade secrets, then you're able to file for an injunctive relief and basically ask the court to stop them from using it, or whatever it may be, um, before you've tried the case. So uh, I was in, we had a client at a client who um, their employee, they had two employees that left and formed a um, competing company during the holiday, Christmas holiday, when they thought nobody would be kind of paying attention, right? They're trying to do it on the radar when everyone was kind of like gone on holiday. And they, uh, they walked out the door with the customer list and the supplier list so that they already automatically knew uh, who to contact and where to get all the products. Uh, so we had to file, uh, we filed an emergency, um, uh, in a motion for injunctive relief, and it was granted. Uh, kind of ruined their their holiday, but uh, our client was very, very happy. Uh, there's a criminal uh, side to it, but that's something that um, is taken up by the AG's office and not uh, private right of action. And then there's also possible seizure if you're talking about uh, any goods um, that might be generated from um, the use of the trade secret. Okay, so I give, I've given you a lot of information really quickly. How does this all come together? So use the uh, an iPhone, a smartphone, and uh, what you can see here is uh, there's going to be, again, a handful of different intellectual property uh, involved in the creation of an iPhone. So there's multiple layers of protected assets. Okay, so here we have. So with the iPhone, we've got a design patent. There was uh, an immense amount of litigation actually over this with uh, Samsung. So the uh, iPhone has a smooth uh, rounded edge that is um, has the, has no functionality, and so it is a design. It was covered under a design patent. And uh, then there's also the underlying utility patents. There was there's a touchscreen patent, uh, translucent images on the computer display, and the audio plug and uh, detection circuitry. It was all covered under a utility patent. So just under patents, uh, there's 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 more than four, but <laughs> there's there's four examples for you. Uh, trademark. So here you have the Apple symbol, which is a logo. Uh, the earlier iterations had iPhone, so that would be a word, a, a word mark. So there would be protection in the word iPhone, in addition to separate protection in the Apple logo. Copyrights will come into play with regard to the mobile apps. So the applications themselves will be covered. The the underlying software may qualify for copyright. Uh, uh, protection. It may qualify for patent protection too, depending on on uh, a number of factors. But it is uh, software is very easy for the most part to obtain uh, copyright registration in. 
So most most applications will be covered. Um, their software will be covered under copyright. Uh, and then in addition, any of the graphics that are created, right? So any of the imagery that goes into the app um, and or the selection and arrangement of the different elements when you pull up the screen, what all that looks like, that's also covered um, by copyright. And then lastly, uh, trade secrets. So you have the operating system itself and um, parts of that have been kept as a trade secret. So you can see um, all the different um, all the different types of protection that you can obtain under the umbrella of intellectual property. Yes. All right. <laughs> and I did it. I was able to I was able to uh, finish the whole presentation uh, with some time for questions. If anybody has has any questions, I will. Stop sharing. Let's see. Actually, let me go back. Okay, so let me see. So if nobody has any questions, um, I did want to talk about a, a couple of things that I didn't put in the presentation. So under the Copyright Act, um, there is a um, there's a provision specifically for uh, fine art, specifically for like sculptures, right? It's called um, the Visual Artist Rights Act. And this may be um, of interest to builders and owners. So uh, under VERA, the, an artist has uh, additional, in addition to the copyright in the work, the artist has additional rights to their art. So let's say that you as a builder or owner you want to commission an artist to create an installation piece for your project. And you hire that, you'll hire that artist. As you may recall, uh, with a work made for hire or right, something that's that's commissioned specially, uh, you as the as the contractor, right, you're you as the owner who've who've commissioned this work, you will be considered the copyright owner only if it falls under those nine categories. And works of fine art aren't specifically covered. So in that case, the artist continues to own the underlying copyright unless there is an assignment. So you want to make sure that there is uh, there's something in writing that provides the builder owner with the rights to, to the work, if that's something that you're interested in, okay, versus an exclusive license to any of the of the underlying rights to the work. But under Vera, the artist has an, has additional rights. And the, where this comes into play is if the builder owner decides that that work that was commissioned it no longer functions the way that the builder owner wants, or let's say that the project that they developed um, is expanding and they need to they need to remove that work. Well, under Vera, an artist has a right to object to that, object to your moving that work. Right, whether whether you're relocating it or you're removing it completely, so that to be mindful of that, uh, because the artist has a right under Vera to be able to stop you and give you an op um, give the artist an opportunity to uh, buy that that work back. Oh, and I see there's a question, so I'll um, I'll discuss that in just a, uh, I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, so uh, this came into play. I'm not sure if you're familiar. There's a there was a, a place uh, in New York called Five Points, and uh, it was really actually internationally known uh, as a, a mecca for graffiti artists. The uh, owner of the of the um, the building, the space where the graffiti was was uh, where the pieces were created and curated, uh, knew that the artists were there and gave permission. So for a number of years, artists would come and uh, there were a couple of people that curated and gave space. And so there were pieces constantly being put up. The developer uh, was reaching a deal with the, the city and was going to uh, tear it all down and put in um, high rise, uh, residential high rise. And, and I think it was a mixed use space. Uh, the artists said, hey, wait, 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 you know, uh, you know, this this is covered under Vera. We we you know we want to um, we want to figure out a way how to maintain it. 
so they they filed an injunction. Remember, we're talking about injunctions, right? You need to have if you you're going to need to have a contract in place to deal with some of this. If you don't, the default is the artist owns the copyright. So you had the you had the graffiti artist say, hey, uh, you need to stop. Um, and uh, they went to court, the, uh, the the district level, and the the judge at the time refused to provide an injunction, an immediate injunction, but warned the developer, right, not to take any further action because they were there was another procedure that was happening, right? Uh, the developer decided that. Uh, uh, he was just wasn't going to listen and whitewashed the entire the entire building whitewashed over all the all the work. And uh, unfortunately, what happened, uh, unfortunately for the developer, uh, they got popped uh, uh, with a seven point three million dollar judgment against them. So uh, it was a costly, costly uh, decision. Um, didn't necessarily have to go go there. Um, there have been reports that it was kind of done in spite for whatever reason. There was some uh, ill will, but but it goes to I think it goes to the point that if you're going to um, if you're going to have uh, art that is specially commissioned or agree to allow art to be on your property that it comes with an, some additional um, protections under under Vera. So be mindful, be mindful of that. Uh, let me take a look. Um, oh, plant, plant patents. Uh, plant patents have to do with, um, and I'm not an expert in this, um, but uh, think of Monsanto and all the, the genetic tinkering that they do to make them um, uh, resistant to mold and, and, and uh, pests and things like that. Uh, that falls under plant plant patents. Um, so I have another question. Aside from customs, what protection does my product design have from being copied in another country? Okay. Uh, so you could, if you have a product design and it falls either under trademark or a design patent, you would, you would, you could do a couple of things, right? You could Go to the um, the country where you think uh, there may be an infringing product being manufactured, and file for protection there. And then what happens when you file for protection there? You then use their customs. You file with their customs um, department, their equivalent of their customs department. What happens is um, products are are checked um, to 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 at two different points, right? One when it's leaving a country. And then one when it's coming into a country. So if you file in the country where you think it's being manufactured or you know it's being manufactured, um, you can if you can obtain those uh, registrations, you can file those with the customs um, within that country and then prevent it um, from being exported to the United States. And then obviously, conversely, at the same time, you would want to file with the U.S. Customs to stop in case it made it through. Um, and got to our shores that then it didn't come in uh, into the US uh, and have our customs um, uh, department stop them. So in, uh, also feel free, I'm happy to answer questions offline so you can submit questions uh, or if I'm not clear about something, I'm happy to kind of go into more detail with you um, later. Uh, the other, I have, um, for trade secrets, there is no legal protection other than the owner's actions, physically protecting it or signing agreements. If that's the case, how do you prove that it is yours? Um, how is the burden and what's the burden of proof on someone else? Okay, sure. So, um, so it's it's it becomes document heavy. Uh, it's evidence, right? So you. Um, So by by showing that you have had employee, by, let me back up. By showing that you've had uh, employees sign in their employment agreement, right? That they recognize that 
they'll be privy to certain information and that information is confidential that includes trade secrets uh, by showing that you have put a handful of uh, additional measures in place by restricting who has access then as i mentioned before that the default is if you show you've taken those reasonable steps the default is the presumption the presumption is is that that's a trade secret and the burden is on the other party to prove otherwise so the other party would have to show that that the information that they are using and obtained was already public okay they they might be able to do that um, by gathering um, uh, industry information right Pre presentations that have been presented within the industry um, articles that have been written uh, whether that's within the industry or by us often academics that talk about whatever it is that you're claiming trade secret in uh, so they'll they'll show by date that right that you're claiming a trade secret and that you've had this secret for X you know you you started this company here and you started offering this product at this time and this product has your your you know is, is a secret but it, it started at had at this date and what the other side may show is that well but all this literature that talks about what you're claiming a secret all happened prior to your use so that you you don't have you don't have a trade secret so that's kind of the process of how that how that works um, let me see uh, I don't see any others um, there we go um, yeah and I think oh and we're at 529. So we have, I think we have one more question. Oh, we do. Oh, okay. Someone just wrote, for instance, sometimes we are given a site plan that has been drawn by another architect, but the owner comes to you and says they want to change portions of the project. What should we do to protect ourselves? Oh, okay. That's a great question. So we talked about um, derivatives. So if they come to you with a plan that you did not uh, you, you didn't create and draw, right? Then, and they're asking you to then take that as the basis. You're, you're, there's a couple ways to deal with this, okay? You can contractually have the owner that's coming to you in a contract assume all liability, right? Warrant to you, give you a representation on, and, and warranty that they have all the rights to the underlying plan. All, they own all the copyrights. And that they're also going to indemnify you if you are sued for copyright infringement, right? So that if later it's determined, if another architect or the architectural firm thinks that you infringed, that no, the owner didn't have, right, the rights that they claim to have, then the owner needs, you know, by, via contract, the owner is then going to step up and indemnify you, provide you with the defense, right? And if, it, you're, if there's liability that's found, um, cover the cost of that liability, right? So you want to you want a representation on warranty, and you want indemnification. So that's one way to do it. Um, another way, another possible way to do it. Uh, it's not as preferred, <laughs> um, but is to simply say to the owner, okay, we might be we'll, we we may be willing to to do this, but you are not going to give me a, a copy. I don't want to see the plans. Do not hand them to me. Do not give them to me. I'm not taking possession and I am not going to see them. Neener, neener, I'm not looking. <laughs> so that um, you have to do a bulk of the work of it, some additional work um, because then you need, you'll you need to draft the right plans from whatever right you're being told. Um, but that way, there's no direct copying in that regard. Now, if those plans, right, if the original plans, as we talked about, right, have any copyrightable elements um, that then are um, that you see and then copy, right? You have you've got potential for infringement. But where you create something all on your own originally that's yours, even if it looks remarkably similar to something else that somebody else has done, there hasn't been any copying. Okay, if you didn't see it and then try to make a copy of it. If you didn't take it and actually look at it and copy it, <laughs> then the, the law says, 
look, there may be two artists who who see the same tree and take a picture, photograph of that same tree, and each will have uh, a copyright in that tree, but neither will be infringing the other. So independent creation can uh, protect you from copyright infringement. Now, with that said, in order to prove all that, you generally have to go to court and you have to battle it out. So it's very costly, which is why preferably the best way to protect yourself is then to get it is to contract with the owner. So the owner comes to you and wants you to take on this project. If you decide to take on the project, again, you make sure that um, the owner is providing you with a representation and warranty that they have all the rights to the work and uh, the underlying copyright and that you can do this work. And to the extent that there is any potential uh, liability that they will indemnify you, right? They will pay for your defense and they will pay any, res any potential resulting damage or settlement that might come from a claim of infringement. So contract, contract law can really uh, be a person's best friend, right? Whether you're an architect, an owner, builder, or you are in any way dealing with um, intellectual property, contract kind of helps fill in holes. And often, like I said, it can also help shift ownership and clear up some ambiguities that may exist um, within, like I said, copy, uh, the, the realm of copyright. I hope that answers your question. Are there any others? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Uh, it was fascinating. I, I think that um, this is such an important uh, topic for architects and design professionals. So I really appreciate your presentation today. Excellent information. And thank you all for being with us. Um, we will be having our um, Women in Architecture meeting again in October or November. And so watch for the um, uh, subject matter that we will be sending out when, once that is determined. Again, thank you, Kim. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a good evening. My pleasure. Have a good evening, everyone.